share a few things uh, with you. Um, as you know, as I announced earlier, um, I, and I did talk to Ramin this morning, he's out of jail. Uh, he was in, uh, incarcerated for preaching the gospel in the mall in Minneapolis, that largest mall in the country or whatever it is. And, uh, and he go, he, I talked to him this morning. He said, I really wasn't even witnessing. Like I said, I was just sharing my faith. And then somebody overheard. Uh, he was sharing his testimony. But, and then they said that he was harassing them and all those types of other things, which is not true. And uh, this is in America. This is what I find extremely alarming. And what I really find alarming, and it's going to really flow with today's message, is the passivity in the body of Christ today. And a lot of people think that grace makes you passive, and that is wrong. If you're truly under grace, I love what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 10. He said, I labored more abundantly than you all, but it wasn't me. It was the grace of God given to me. In other words, if you and I are truly under grace, we're going to be zealous. We're going to be on fire. We're going to be active with the things of God, but we're not working to earn anything. Jesus has earned it all. That's why he sat down. But if we don't understand that, we're going, we're going to be messed up. But I just want to give a plug for Ramin's book, From Ashes to Glory. I also have videos in there. He's got Exposing Sharia Law and the Testimony of, of Ramin Parsa. I just wanted to say that. I thought, I mean, wow, the plane situation he went through in the 1st of August and this. And, I, and, and, and he said going up to Minneapolis to, when it was called up there to, to minister at some churches, he said pray because the community, the Islamic community is worked up because he is exposing these things. And like I said, I just, I just have such a passion to see us people in America. We, need, we should be the most zealous, most fired up, most intense for Jesus people you ever saw. Not weirdoism. I'm not talking about being weird. I'm talking about being intense, being fervent in spirit, as I shared out of Romans 12, 11, and 12. So, so that's really powerful. But it, the message today, I, I, cra I crack myself up because I got all these things. I'm going to share this, share that, share that. And I think, no, I'm not. <laughs> you don't have that kind of time. <laughs> and, but it's all good. It's, it's really, really good. And, and, and I got my little uh, dry erase board up here. And as you can see, I'm quite the artist. And uh, <laughs> can, can any, uh, I don't know if you all can see that. I want to, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But I, I just want you to see, as you go to 3 John, verse 2, very familiar verse of scripture. I, I've entitled this message, The Greatest Hindrance to Soul Prosperity. Now, I don't know if it's the greatest. I personally think it is. But, but if it's not, it's right there. Uh, uh, incorrect information could be uh, the greatest hindrance to soul prosperity. But, but I'm talking about for people that are getting correct information for, uh, as far as their understanding of Scripture and they're, they're being pointed the right way. I believe this is the greatest uh, hindrance of what I'm going to talk about. And we always define the soul. Well, let's read the verse first. Beloved. That's so good. Isn't that good? Yeah. Beloved. So who's he talking to? The beloved, believers, you and I, Christians, those that are beloved in Christ. <clears throat> he said, I pray that you may prosper in every way. Uh, that's the Amplified. Uh, and that, that your body may keep well, even as your, as your soul keeps well and prospers. Go to the King James if you don't mind, although I like that. But it just it's sometimes the Amplified's a little wordy. And, and uh, uh, it says, beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper. The word prosper means to go forward. <clears throat> excuse me, to increase, to grow. Amen? Right. That's what it means. <clears throat> excuse me. And be in health even as your soul prospers. Now we know from, <clears throat> excuse me, can I have my water? From 1 Thessalonians chapter uh, 5, verse 23, that we are three part. This is review for a lot of you, but you need to keep hearing it. We are spirit, soul, and body, right? <clears throat> the part of us that gets born again is our spirit. 1 <clears throat> Corinthians 6, 17 says, He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. So the part of us that gets born again is our spirit. Amen. And then there's our body, which is, we all know our body. We look, it's our earth suit, as we call it. Yeah. But our soul, and we define our soul often, as I have on the dry erase board, our soul, up there, soul. Suke in Greek, right? Suke, and, and it's your mind, will, and emotion. Now, I hear a lot of people talk about your mind, and that's good. You know, we're not to be conformed to this world. We're to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, Romans 12, 2. We need, we, need, we need the correct information. That's huge, huge, right? And then we talk about your emotions, harnessing your emotions. I totally, that's an awesome, awesome teaching. Because if you just let your emotions run wild, you'll be wild. Right. Amen? Amen? 
And as, as someone has so accurately said, when we indulge our negative emotions, it's like having intercourse with the devil. That's strong, but it's true. <clears throat> but I don't hear too many people talk about our will. And I think it's because in grace circles, I'm a grace guy, grace and faith guy, I like to say it that way. A lot of times we think if, if, if I exert my will at all, that I'm somehow being legalistic. Nothing could be further from the truth. Now, if you exert your will in your own strength, separate from him, that's what the Bible calls will worship in Colossians 2. That's not what we're talking about. But we need to understand our will involves my choice. When I choose to go God's way, when I choose to esteem the things of God, that's when his power kicks in. <clears throat> Andrew Walmack's got an excellent teaching called Effortless Change. But you know, if you study it, it's effortless once you decide to look to God. That's when it's effortless. That's the change is effortless. But you have to exert it. You labor, Hebrews 4.11, to enter into that rest. There's a, there's a, and there's an exercising of your will. Amen. You know what I've discovered? You go on Facebook. You know, the, you know what people like to hear? There's nothing wrong with you. You're great. Just keep treating people terrible. It's, it's okay. There's nothing wrong with you. That's wrong. If you're born again, your spirit's perfect. It's sealed. It's a done deal. But you've got a soul and you've got a body. And I can guarantee you that there's things that God wants to change. God accepts you right where you are, but he loves you too much to let you stay where you are. And if you don't understand that, you know, Ramin said this to me four years ago, and I shared it earlier. He said, there's people in the grace camp that don't understand praying in the spirit for lengths of time. They just think that's works. Well, then Paul was messed up. He, the apostle of grace was messed up. Meditate. You, know, you don't read your Bible. Listen, if you don't do any of these things, God still loves you, but you're not going to realize it. You're not going to realize it. And you, we have to use our will. Our, my will has been graced as much as my mind and my emotions have. But see, when I offer my soul through my will, when I offer this thing on the altar of God's grace, God, the, the life that's in my born-again spirit right now begins to flow through me, but it involves my will. It involves my will. Well, we're going to go through some things. Okay, the enemy's weapon of lies. Look at this in your outline. So let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Watch this, verse 23. <clears throat> There's so many things we could say about each one of these verses, but I'm just going to hit some high points. But foolish and unlearned questions get involved. Avoid them. Why? Knowing that they gen do gender or breed strifes. You know, the Lord recently gave me a scripture verse in dealing with someone. I won't tell you who it is. And no, it's not anybody. In it's not my wife. It's not Emerson. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but speak not in the ears of a fool, for he will despise the wisdom of your words. What is a fool? Someone who leans to their own understanding. So don't even go there. Because, you know, I have all this great advice, or, you know, I think I do sometimes. You know, we're all like that, right? But if they're not listening, don't waste your time. Don't waste your time. And that's what the Lord spoke to me. I said, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Anyhow. But foolish and unlearned questions, boy, why? Knowing that they do gender strives. Next verse. And the servant of the Lord must not strive. You know, James 3 says, where there's envy and strife, there's confusion, unrest, and every evil work. Servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto a man, apt to teach. Patient, leave that up there. The word apt to teach, watch this, means skillful in teaching. That's all of us. We should be skillful in conveying what we believe. You know, I, I'll tell you what. I, I, oh, by the way, if you didn't get an outline from last week, sign up with Julie and you can get one. I am a fanatic when it comes to outlines. I want people to leave here with something in their hand that they can take home and meditate and even the stuff we don't cover, you can look it up. Because you have to, listen, you've got to fight, hear me, fight to get these things in your heart. God, I, I heard one quiet amen. You have to fight. The whole world's screaming at you. Your senses are screaming at you. Everything's screaming at you to the contrary. That's why the Bible says the carnal mind's the enemy of God. It, it only looks at what it can see, touch, feel, see, all smell, etc. the five senses. But listen, you've got to fight to take these things. Remind me to get to that. Fight the good fight of faith. It's a good fight because Jesus has won the victory, but it's a fight nonetheless. 
See, in great, quote, grace people, they don't get this. Well, you know, God's in control. He's going to do what he wants. Well, then why are you here? Why are you trying to get more correct information? Why are you trying to grow? You know, that's another attack. There's a real attack on the local church. Let me tell you, if the enemy can separate you from a local church, he's got a level of you. And it's a matter of time. Man, it gets quiet. See, you know the messages that people like? You're great. You're just so great. It's, oh. I, I just read a thing I put on my Facebook, and it said, uh, it said something like, what? Uh, one per, uh, churchgoer says, man, I didn't like the worship today. And the other person looks at him and says, that's okay, we weren't worshiping you. <laughs> <laughs> See, we get it wrong. We think it's about us. It's not. It's about him. See, that, you know, that's where freedom's at. <sighs> so many verses I want to go to them, but I'm just going to say them. In John, uh, Acts chapter 20, verse 24, Paul was talking about persecution and going up to Jerusalem and all these things, and he said in verse 24, neither count I my life dear unto myself that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I've received of the Lord Jesus Christ to testify the gospel of the grace of God. I don't count my life dear unto myself so I can finish my course with joy. You know why we don't have joy? Because we're counting our lives dear unto ourselves. <laughs> This is true Christianity, guys. God's got an abundant life for every one of us, but it may not be the same as what the world calls. God wants to increase us financially so we can spread His kingdom, not ours. And in the meantime, He doesn't care if we enjoy things. But when we make enjoying things the thing, we miss what it's really all about. Hallelujah. The servant of the Lord, he must be apt to teach. Patient. Ooh, there's a big one. Look, watch this. I got to move quick. Look at verse, the next verse. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. That oppose themselves. Boy, I could go on and on here. Let me show you how foolish it is. People will say, oh, man, you're, you're Islamophobe. You're against. But then you're talking about a relig uh, religion that persecutes women, persecutes gay people, persecutes. I mean, that's what you're talking about. That's opposing yourself. That's stupid. What's a nice word for stupidity? There is none. That's deception. See, but you can't talk that way because, no, I just want to be honest. I'm not trying to be politically correct. I want God's truth to be exalted. But in the meantime, you're probably going to be called some names because that's what the devil does. He's the accuser. He's the slander. He wants to accuse your character. Hallelujah. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If peradventure... Uh, uh, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and here's what I'm after, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Now watch this. Why? They're all, because they're opposing themselves. They put themselves in Satan's territory. Let's look at this. That they may recover. Watch this. It means to, oh, this is so good. It means to sober up. It means to return to sobriety. It means to return to one's senses. The metaphor implies some previous duping by evil influences. As in the case of intoxication, the devil's method, here it is, oh, this is so good, is to numb, numb the conscience, which will confuse the senses and ultimately paralyze the will. Woo! Now watch this. I'm going to pick each one of these apart. I'm not, I could spend a lot longer on this, but I'm going to go quick because I'm going to try to get this outline done. But watch this. First of all, if he can numb your conscience. You know your conscience is the voice of your soul, the voice of your heart. And see, people are confused. Let me show you. People think that when, when you repent, you repent of acts of sin. No, you repent from dead works. You repent from trying to approach God based on your merit. Repent means to change your mind, metanoia. And you repent from that, and that's what will help, help you overcome sins, plural. Let me show it to you. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. Watch this. So if your conscience is numb and you think Christianity is all about keeping the rules, right? Isn't that what most people think? You know, I told you about the guy we used to work with. Well, as long as you keep seven of the big ten. I always tell him all the time, that's a 70. That's passing. D minus, but I get you right. That's not how it is. If you keep the whole law, James says, and yet offend in one point, you're guilty of the whole thing. The only one that ever did that was Jesus. 
But notice, he's talking about offering the blood of bulls and goats, but he says in verse 14 of Hebrews 9, how much more, say how much more, how much more? shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. Watch this. Notice what it does. Purge your conscience from sins. No, from dead works in order to serve the living God. We got to be purged from thinking that anything we do merits anything from God. People say, oh, Chris, you talk about sowing and reaping. Sowing is simply releasing seed. It's not earning or creating anything. Your words don't cause God to do anything. Your words are merely agreeing with what he's already done. And it's signing on the line. It's receiving what's already yours. But see, if you get that mixed up, see, I was thinking about how I used to believe and everything was a work. Everything was about what I did to get God to move. Everything. And that's why it never worked. You know why we can have confidence for healing? Because we simply release the life of Christ in the name of Jesus. That's all we have to do. But people say, well, what do I need to do? You don't need to do anything to earn. You just need to agree. Sign for the package. But see, if he can numb the conscience, if you're confused in the area of your conscience, if you're confused about the reason you do what you do, then your conscience will go numb. Amen. Now watch this. Numb the conscience. Then what happens? Confuse the senses. This is why, go to Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. Hebrews 5, verse 12. Watch this. This, I used to be confused about these verses, but I'm not as confused as I used to be. Well, I'm less confused. <laughs> All right. For when, the time, for, for when for the time you ought to be teachers. Now watch this. God desires us to be able to instruct. You have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and, become, and you are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Next verse. Watch this. Two more verses. For everyone that uses milk, he's unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Next verse. For strong meat belongeth to them that are, that are of full age, they're mature. Even those who by reason of use, habit, hexus in Greek, habit, have their senses, have their senses trained, exercised to discern good and evil. Notice it's not discern good from evil. Think about that. See, we think it's discern, well, that's good, that's bad. No, to discern good. Good isn't always God. To discern the good. There's a way that seems right to a man, but it only brings him death, right? So you have your senses trained. But notice it's through use. It's through habit. It's been said you, you form your habits, then your habits form you. The secret to your future is hidden in your daily routine. But see, well, that's not grace. That is grace. That's responding to the grace of God. God told me quite some time ago, he said, I want you to do this. And it wasn't a lot. You have to understand, I'm a zealous person. When I pick out things for me, it's like, boom. Like, I have, you know, if I haven't ran in however long, well, let me think, I'll go out and I'll start with 26. You've never done that in your life, Chris. You won't start with 26. But that's how I am. You know, I learned with these, having these honeybee hives. Well, let's just get, oh, we'll have 15, 20 colonies. I hardly have time for one. I mean, but that's, see, I'm learning. Chris, stop it. Get my mind. But see, it's by reason of use. You build into things. And when you're, when you're obedient at one level, God shows you the next level. But see, we have this inflated opinion of ourselves that we think we're much further than we are in our maturity level, and we're not. Start where, that's what God showed me. I stopped praying, use me, Lord, and started praying, make me usable. It's a big difference. And now God's starting to, I can see God doing, moving. I can see him moving. He's doing things. I thought you said he's already moved. He has. The Holy Spirit takes the move of God and makes it a movement in your life. Glory to God, that's good. Strong meat belongs to those who are mature, who by reason of use or habit have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Now back to, back to your outline. So the enemy's method is to, first of all, he numbs the conscious, and if he can do that, he confuses the senses. Sense, uh, senses. What is it? Senses. And the words uh, uh, for... Uh, who by reason of use in Hebrews 5.14 is hexus. It means habit, a power acquired by custom. 
practice or use. Wait a minute, Chris, don't we already have this power? Yes, in the spirit. But you've got to access it and get it into your experience. Got it? It's good stuff. And if, and if he can numb the conscious and confuse the senses, senses, he'll ultimately paralyze your will. Well, I've seen this happen a lot with people. They, they can know what's right. I'll, I'll give you an example. When people, I, when people think, well, I can handle it. You can't handle it. I've heard people that are dating people, and they're thinking, oh, I can handle it. No, you can't. I tell them all the time, you can't. Once you get close to somebody, that's that freight train going downhill, and you're not stopping it. I told someone a while back, I said, you know, it's better to marry than to burn. Marriage is still God, by the way. God does not endorse shacking. He loves you, but that's not his plan. Let me tell you, statistically, people that live together before they get married statistically have a the greater rate percentage chance of failure. Now, God loves you. He's not rejecting you. I'm just telling you the truth. When's the last time you heard anybody preach on, out of the New Testament verse, by the way? Hebrews chapter 13, I believe it's verse 4. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. You know, me and Jen had to get married because I can't contain. And she definitely can. <laughs> Can I say that? <laughs> Our kids have been watching the Steve Urkel's Family Matters. So funny. That is a hilarious show. And anyhow, I didn't mean to get off on that. <laughs> but my point is, that's not a condemning thing. That's an honest thing. And God, listen, God's not going to reject you over sin. He's already, that was already placed on Jesus. But there are consequences of going your own way. What's it, that's so hard for people. And see, our will is involved. There are also blessings in going God's way. Listen, I love being around people that are fanatic for Jesus. Now, I'm not talking about weird. I'm talking about consistently intense on the Lord. Consistently intense because I'm telling you that's the difference. That's the difference. That's what people like Smith Wigglesworth were all about. Were they perfect? No. Did they, have every, did they believe everything perfectly? No. None of us do. We're growing, hopefully. I used to say everyone's growing, but I've discovered everyone is not growing. A lot of people are going backwards. They're still, if they're born again, they're going straight to heaven. But I'm telling you, there's a life of victory. And you're in a war. If you don't know you're in a war, you're already getting whipped. You're already getting whipped. Amen. Praise God. These are messages that I believe God is leading me to preach because the church needs to be stirred up. If, you're not, if you do not stay stirred up, you will settle to the bottom. Now watch this. All right, let's go back to the outline. So if the enemy can numb the conscience, he'll confuse your senses and ultimately paralyze your will. Back to 2 Timothy uh, uh, chapter 2 and uh, verse 26. It says, who are taken captive by him at his will. The word who are taken captive is zugreo, zugreo, and it's in the perfect tense, passive voice. What does that mean? It means, first of all, it means to take alive. The Greek verb perfect tense is a present state as a result of a past action with continuous or ongoing results. And the passive voice means the subject, and that's the one who's been taken captive, receives the action. In other words, a person who is taken captive by Satan is somebody who has not yielded their will to the things of God. And as a result, their conscience becomes numb, their senses become confused, and their will is paralyzed. They're taken captive. But see, this doesn't have to be you and me. I've been around a lot of people, and, and you know, I'll give you an example. When you minister in the nursing home, there's people there, you share the most awesome powerful new covenant message and they can't hear it and they won't hear it you know why because years and years and years of accepting religious lies over what the word of god teaches and you don't have to be in a nursing home i see a lot of other people you can be locked in your way human religion i call it the devil's halfway house causes you to do god halfway and think man that, that's that's it and then and then all of a sudden you're numb yeah i'm cool Listen, God loves you. That's a settled day because he is love, not because you're lovely. All right? God love that's, that's settled, that's done. But how I receive and respond to that is totally based on what I choose to do. All right, we're going to, I've got to fly here. 
They're taken captive. Any doctrine, oh, this is good, including grace that renders one passive towards the things of God is endorsed by hell itself. <laughs> In your outline. Now watch this. Any doctrine that renders one unfaithful is endorsed by hell. Prove it to me. Oh, I will. Second, I go to 2 um, Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. We'll go to 20 first. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, and then we'll back up. Watch this. Watch this. For all, we love this verse, don't we? I do too. For all the promises of God in Him, or yeah, and in Him, or amen, under the glory of God by or through us. We love that, don't we? Back up to verse 17. Watch this. This is Paul speaking. Wherefore, I therefore was thus minded. When I was thus minded, or had this on my mind, did I use lightness? The word lightness means, watch this, it means lightness in regard to weight, it means shallow-minded, it means inconsistent, it means a behavior that is uh, characterized by instability, it means fickleness. Paul said, was I fickle? Was I fickle? That's what he's saying. Or the things that I purpose. Oh, there's your will. Oh, Paul, you're being legalistic. You know, you've got to purpose things because your flesh ain't always going to feel like it. You know what's helping our marriage? Jen hasn't even noticed it. I'm learning. After all this time, stop. Just listen. She doesn't want answers. But I have them all. <laughs> As soon as she gets that, she'll say, man, you have all the answers, don't you? Amen, <laughs> Amen Mark. <laughs> you give me a ride home, brother? <laughs> no, okay. Do I use lightness or the things that I purpose? Do I purpose according to the flesh? And what does that look like? That with me there should be yes, yes, and no, no. Why, well, I thought, you know, God. I get a, I'm amazed at how God leads people sometimes. He's leading me to do this, and he's leading me to, then he changes his mind. He's leading me to do that. And he's, look at this. I purpose. I purpose. If you st it's not how you start, it's how you finish. If you start, don't quit. If this is now, listen, if you missed it, and we all have, you can adjust, and we, and we do that. But man, be a long-haul person. Purpose it. Look at it. It says the things that I purpose. I'm not fickle with this. You know the key to staying on fire for God? Purpose every day to have relationship with Him. You know why I like a Bible reading plan, reading through the Bible in a year? You know why? Because it causes me to read everywhere in the Bible. But Chris, sometimes, isn't that legalistic? No! Do you know why I like to have an accountability group with running? My five miles, well, it's seven now. But you know why? Because I like running, but not that much. <laughs> and one day, though, there's only one guy going to show up this day, and that alarm goes off a little before five, and I'm thinking, ah. Then I think, oh, so-and-so is going to be out there. I better go. And then once I'm up, I'm cool, right? But you know, what is it? Is that legalism or is that discipline? That's taking my will. That's being a person of excellence. You know, God loves you where you're at, but God won't promote you if you are not a person that's willing to cooperate with him. Because he loves you too much. You don't promote somebody that's too immature to drive. You don't promote them to driving. At least not knowingly, hopefully. Why? Because it's a huge responsibility. And with ministry comes all kinds of things. Amen? And, and that's ministry at any level. That doesn't mean necessarily a pulpit ministry. We're all called. You know what I've learned about having kids? <laughs> it's a whole other world. <laughs> it's a huge world. Wow. I thought it was easy. Wrong. <laughs> It's a challenge. Amen? Hallelujah. Sorry. Glory to God. Watch this. Any doctrine that renders one unfaithful. So Paul said that I use lightness, that with me there should be yes, yes. Do I purpose these things according to the flesh? Go to the next verse. But as God is true, our word towards you was not yes and no. We weren't up and down, in and out, all around. Do you want to grow yes or no? Yes. So do I i got to cooperate with God. Can two walk together except they be in agreement? God loves me. 
If I don't cooperate and do my, God loves me. I can destroy my life and he'll be right there while I'm destroying it. He'll never leave me nor forsake me. Say, I got a better way for you. You know why so many people are miserable, Christians? Because they know what God's calling them to do, but they're rebelling on the inside. That's a miserable existence. And God still loves you. Why? Because it's against who you are. Next verse. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you, even by me and Sylvanus and Timotheus, was not yes and nay, but in him was yes. The reason people have struggle having confidence in God's word is because many times their word means nothing. This is good stuff. This is stuff that will take the grace of God and begin to implement it in your life. And you'll begin to see the change. Hallelujah. Glory to God. This is what I say. I, I get so concerned about the American church because I know what's happening. I mean, I know that I know that I know what's happening. And it's up to the church. Satan has one fear, and that's the church. He hates us because we stand in the way of total destruction of a society. Seriously. Well, Chris, um, I was taught it was all about me. Can I get, oh. Let me throw this at you because it needs to be here. All right? Go to Hebrews 10, verse 35 and 36. This is not in my message. I just want to show it to you. Let's say, let's get things in perspective, okay? See, we think persecution involves the wrong brother. They got their fifth flat screen TV. We only got four. You're being persecuted for the gospel, aren't you? Yeah. And we take verses like, cast not away, therefore your confidence which have great recompense of reward. <laughs> yeah. Next verse. For you have need of patience that after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Amen. That's all about me. Back up to verse 32, and I'll show you what it's about. This is what it's about. For call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, you were enlightened, you endured a great fight of afflictions. Look at the next verse. Partly whilst you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst you became companions of them that were so used. Persecution. Next verse. For you had compassion of me and my bonds, my imprisonments, and you took joyfully the spoiling, the plundering of your goods, knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Next verse. Cast not away your confidence. Keep this in perspective. God, God wants us to enjoy things, but this is, it's not about this little vapor of a life. It's about the big picture. And in the meantime, God wants... See, my goal, I pray, Lord, let me fulfill the reason that you put me on this earth. That's my goal. And it's very short. We don't have much time. And if we don't keep it in perspective, then we'll think it's about, well, I was, I'm just believing this. I'm, listen, I want things to go good in this life. He's given me richly all things to enjoy, but not for the purpose of making it about those things and missing the main thing. But see, that's what these verses are talking about. They're in the New Testament. You don't hear anybody talk about them, except me. <laughs> but they're there. They're there to help us. That no matter what's going on in this life, I'm going to heaven. I'm a child of God. I want to go with abundance. I want to go with a, I want to go as here, well done, good and faithful serving son. That's what I want to hear. Amen? See, that's part, that's, that's finishing your course with joy. I want to finish my course with joy. Amen? Amen. See, people try to do God halfway. It doesn't work. He loves you. He'll never reject you. If you're born again, you're going to heaven. But I'm telling you, your love for him is a big deal. How you respond to his love for you. Is another way to say it. All right, back to this. Look, they're taking captive. Um, well, let's go back to uh, on your outline under under Second Corinthians uh, one verse seventeen through twenty. Look at this. It's not willpower, but it's yielding your will to God's power. Got that? It's not human willpower, but it's yielding your will to God's power. All right. Look at this. I'm going to show you one. First Corinthians fourteen. 13, we'll start with verse 13. 14, 13, 14, and 15. Watch this. I want to show you something. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. Next verse. 
For he that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not in them, or, or my spirit prayeth by speaking in an unknown tongue. My understanding is unfruitful. Look at verse 15. This is what I'm after. What is it then? I will. Say it again. I will. I will. I will. Pray with the spirit and pray with the understanding. I will. I will. I will sing with the spirit. And sing with the understanding. I will sing. See the I wills there? You know what that is? That's the choice. That's not legalism. That's responding to God's word for your benefit. Pray without ceasing. Present tense. Middle voice. Imperative mood. You know what middle voice is? Subject cooperates for his benefit. In, with positive in positive verses. Amen? It's my will. See, we, get, we need correct information, but if all of our information is just information, it doesn't change anything. I've been talking about words. We talked about this Thursday night. The Lord has been showing me how powerful my words are. Man, I keep getting it more and more. And he said, listen to how you talk and how other people around you talk. You hear very little speaking God's word. Very little praise. Now, God still loves you, and the promises are yours. But how you talk, what comes out of your mouth naturally is what you really believe. Come on. Good stuff. See, you don't earn it. You're see, that's another thing. I understand now that my saying stuff is not my charismatic rosary where I have to say it so many times and then I draw it in. No, it's already done. I'm saying it is releasing it. It's convincing my heart. I'm just saying, I'm just agreeing with God. And to not say it is to refuse it. Remember, we studied that. It's not signing for the package. That's strong. Start today. Don't wait. Start saying, I'm going to do a, a, an inventory. I'm going to listen to how I talk. And if I'm not praising the Lord, I'm going to change things by changing the focus of my heart. Get a promise. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in thy righteousness. That's Psalm 31, verse 1. It's a verse that I claim for me. I claim it for me. Psalm 71, 16 is another one I claim. Thank you, Mark. I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention. I will make mention of your righteousness, even of yours only. You got to sign. You got to agree. You got to speak. You got to talk. You got to declare. Not for the purpose of earning. It's already done. But agreeing. That's what the word confess means. It means to say the same thing. Can you see the difference? See, but it all comes by understanding that using your will to yield to God's word is not legalism. It's simply agreement. Can two walk together except they be in agreement? Amos 3.3. 3. Notice it's talking about a walk, not a position. Your children are still your children, even if they go their own way. But I guarantee you they're not receiving the benefits of your parenthood by going their own way. But they're still your children. That's their position. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's not willpower, but it's yielding your will to God's power. The enemy has launched an attack of lies on the understanding of one's will, especially in gray circles. Example, most people live by information or reason only or by their emotions. Think about that. Well, how do you feel about that? How do you say it, Emerson, that commercial? Sometimes I feel like a nut, sometimes I don't. Seriously. Now watch this. Information. Doer versus here. This is amazing. Go to Luke 6, 46. I'm going to fly. I, I, I won't do the Message Bible, just the King James. And then I'm going to go to... Um, oh, man. Hallelujah. We're going to fly here. Uh, Luke 6, 46. Jesus said, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and, and do not the things which I say? Whosoever cometh to me and heareth, notice he hears, my sayings and does them or, or doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. Next verse. He is like a man which built a house and digged deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when, when the flood arose, not if it arose, and the stream beat vehemently or violently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. Now the rock is doing what Jesus has said. Responding to him. It's not Jesus. The rock that doesn't roll. He is a rock. 
But this context, he's talking about doing what he said, responding. Now watch this. And the ruin of that house was great. Next verse. But he that heareth and doeth not. Notice they both heard. Everybody say heard. He's, and, and doesn't respond. He's like a man or a woman who, who without a foundation built a house upon the earth. And it, notice that he didn't dig deep. See, dig, d- digging deep, it takes time. There's effort. You know, reading my Bible every day takes time. There's effort. There's things involved. It's, I love it. Okay? It's, he hears and he doesn't do it. He's like a man who without a foundation built a house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. So once again, what does a house do? It provides shelter, provides safety from the elements, all those types of things. So he said, we're building our house one way or another. Proverbs says, through wisdom is a house builder. Now, James 1, 22. But very familiar verse. Very familiar verse. Watch this. We're just about done. Hang with me. Very familiar verse. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own self. Now, we always think this means, that, you know, you got uh, to do all the discipline. You gotta do it. Listen, you got to do to earn. That's not what this is talking about. I'm going to show you what a doer of the word of God is. First of all, notice if I don't do the word of God, if I just hear the word of God, Satan doesn't have to deceive me. I deceive myself. Okay? That's why it's important to take these things to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, how do you want me to respond to what I've heard? Amen? Now watch this. Go to, go to the next two verses, then I'm all after verse 25. If anyone be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like somebody who beholds his face, his natural face, in a glass or a mirror. Watch this. For he beholds himself, he goes his way, he immediately, straightway, forgets what manner of man he was. In other words, he, forget what, he forgets what he saw in the mirror. Notice he's talking about being a doer of the word of God. He's like, and not being a doer. If I look into the mirror, I walk away, I forget, right? What manner of man I was. There, there's two different ways. Go to the next verse. Here we go. But whoso, I would say whoso, that's anybody, a believer, who looks into the, I love this, the perfect or the complete law, law standard of liberty or freedom. That's the new covenant. New covenant. Now watch this. He's looking into it. He's gazing. And he continues therein. He continues to look into the new covenant. He continues to look into the mirror of God's word to see who he is in Christ, who Christ is in him. He continues to look. This is a doer of the word of God. Can you see that? That's what a doer of the word of God is. It's not well if he fasts 40 days a week and then he prays so many hours and then he does all. See, that's what people hear. That's not it at all. It's how God leads you. But this has to be this has to be in place or you will not be a doer of the word of God. You'll be a doer of some religious disciplines that even though they may be good in the right context, they're wrong in your context because you're not looking into the perfect law of liberty. My word, this is good. Look at this. But if whoso looks into the perfect law of liberty, he continues looking therein. He continues looking into the word to see who he is in Christ and who Christ is in him. He being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, singular work. What is it? Looking into the perfect law of liberty. Are you a doer of the word of God? Are you looking at what Jesus has done? Are you looking at what you're doing to earn what Jesus has done? There's one work. One work. One work. We're coming back here. Go to James or John, chapter 2, or 5, I think it is. Verse 28, I think. I may be wrong. John, chapter 5, verse 28. No, that's not it. John, chapter 12. Where if it says, no, what must we do to work the work? 6, 28. I got it. I knew it was there. John 6. Yeah, then said they unto him, Jesus, what must we do to work the works of God? Look at the next verse. This is it. You've got to fast for so many days. You've got to stand on your head for more days. You've got to touch not, taste not, handle not. Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work. Here it is that you believe on. Literally the Greek, ice into, motion into him whom he has sent. That's the work of God. Now go back to James 1.25. Watch this. But whoso looks into the perfect law of liberty, he being not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work, 
We just saw it in John chapter 6. He's a doer of the work of what? Looking into the perfect law of liberty. Seeing it's about Jesus. Now watch this. He being not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work. This man, watch this. This man or woman shall be blessed in what they do. Their deed. Now go to the next two verses. This is so good. Golly, I pray you're hearing this. I'm hearing it better and better as I go over it. If any man among you seems to be religious, have a form of God, worship, etc., and he doesn't bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is useless. If your mouth doesn't agree with what you're looking at in the Word of God, your religion is void and useless. You may be going to heaven, but you're not experiencing a lot of heaven here. Glory to God. Can you see it? It all starts with being a doer of the work. Believing on Him. Looking into the perfect law of liberty. What He's made available. Who you are in Christ and who He is in you. But if you, if you seem to be religious, you don't bridle your tongue. So if your words aren't in agreement with what you're seeing even in the Word, your, your religion is vain. Are you seeing it? One more verse. Pure religion and undefiled. Watch this. This is what it looks like. Before God and the Father is this. To visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. To reach out to people. To have CR meetings and roundtable meetings or whatever. To reach out to people. To mow grass for the gentleman we mow grass for. Whatever. This is it. Pure religion. Undefiled. It's two things. Everybody say two things. Okay, I got two people that said it. I'll try it again. Everybody say two things. I knew it was better than that. Pure religion and undefiled before God. And this is what it looks like to people. It's to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Now we think that's, well, yeah, no smoking, dipping, or chewing, or going with girls who do, right? Isn't that what we think it is? That's not what it is. You know what the world's? It, it, it's, it's approaching God the same way the world does based on their merit instead of Jesus. That's what worldliness is. It's, 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 it's a heart, it's a conscience that has not been purged from dead works. It still thinks it's about you. See, that's why people, you know what people say, he's a good man. You know what I think? There ain't none good but God. And if he's not, listen, your flesh is no more holier than a lost man. And unless you're yielded to the Lord, you're capable. Don't ever say, I would never. Don't kid yourself. <laughs> See, in order to go high in God, you've got to go low in yourself. This is what it looks like. Pure religion, undefiled before God and the Father is this. To visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted. To stop thinking it's about what he does for God and realize it's all about what God did for you. That's why there's nothing else. Listen, there's nothing else. When something good happens, the only one thing I can do is say, thank you, Lord. This is all about you. This is all about you. I seek humility, guys. I seek it. Because when you're as strong and as athletic as I am, Come on, Emerson. You weren't supposed to laugh. <laughs> no. Seriously, we have to seek it because if we don't, we'll go back to depending on us. Most of us, most people depend on their, what they think, their reason, or how they feel. I don't want that. That's where I make mistakes. Well, praise the Lord. This is the difference between information, being a doer of the Word of God, and a hearer only. I'm going to have to stop right there, but boy, there's some really good things that we didn't cover. But you got an outline, right? And if you want an outline from last week, see Julie.